So I'll introduce our first speaker. Um, the title is loosely How You Make Money as an Artist. So Tom does a number of different things. He has a bit of a portfolio career to keep himself going. He's an artist and curator, and he works with us doing technical stuff a lot of the time. Um, so he's going to go through uh, his kind of career. So Tom's an artist and curator. He trained in Nottingham and in Glasgow. In 2005, Tom and three colleagues set up Moot Gallery in Nottingham, which kind of kick-started the artist-run scene in Nottingham and took up the flame started by the Midland Group 20 years earlier. The success of Moot's focus on working with young artists and that peers led to uh, showing work at art fairs and hosting exhibitions internationally, as well as inspiring a number of studio groups and galleries to settle in Nottingham, including my own. We kind of took over that space and they very much inspired what we did. Um, but also they worked closely with Stand Assembly, Trade and Primary, and were kind of instrumental in setting up that scene in Nottingham. Alongside this, Tom has presented many projects which have a collaborative form of growth at their heart. Um, from projects like Keep Doors and Passageways Clear, which is a series of poster commissions for the entrance space to 1 Forsby Street, to Marble Dreams, projects have been displayed to critical acclaim at White Columns, New York, and the Modern Institute in Glasgow. Uh, Keep Doors and Passageways Clear now sits within the Arts Council collection. Recently, Tom has set up TG Gallery, which is housed in Primary in Nottingham. Uh, the next exhibition, Grains, by Alison Lloyd, opens on the 19th of September. Um, that sounds really professional. I'm to get a copy. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded really good. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, to be totally honest, the, the actual title of the talk that's advertised is slightly inconsistent with the original premise that I was kind of invited to do this talk on. So to kind of for it to say how to make money from your art is probably a little bit misleading. I think if I knew that I wouldn't be here um, <laughs> or I'd be charging an awful lot of money to everybody here for that kind of secret. Um, in, in all honesty I know hundreds of artists, I probably only know about one that actually makes a decent living from his, from his art. So um, I think sort of going into the career of being an artist in the hope of making money is probably a little bit kind of ill-advised, maybe a bit naive. Um, but you know, we will pick up on some of those things. Just because of that slight kind of inconsistency, maybe if someone, if people have come here with a specific agenda or things they want to find out, then I'd encourage them just to ask me questions through the talk. I kind of prefer it to be a bit like that as opposed to being completely one-sided. So there's something I'm saying and I've, I've glossed over something, then just uh, don't even put your hand up, just ask me a question and we'll, hopefully it can be a bit sort of two-way. Um, also, the way in which I'm presenting might not be completely consistent with some of your own individual practices as well. I've worked as an artist, a curator, I've worked for commercial galleries, institutional galleries, university galleries, um, I've worked as a graphic designer, um, I've done a lot of different sort of things. So. Uh, hopefully those sorts of things will come across through this. Um, I'm going to sort of base it kind of biographically in a way, going back to when I was kind of like 19, 18, 19 years old till sort of present. Um, so hopefully some of these things will just sort of spark off um, ideas in people's heads and whatnot. Um, the first three slides, so this is Milton Keynes Gallery in Milton Keynes. This is Oxford Modern Art. And this is the Chisholm Gallery. So when I was in my between when I was in the summer between my second year and my third year on my BA, I went and volunteered for these galleries and I just got into contact with them. And I said I'd really like to come and just help out on an exhibition for a couple of weeks. And it was completely voluntary. And I went and did that, it was brilliant. There was people there who were my own age, there were people there who were a, a lot older than me, um, and there was a whole range of people just wanting to get involved, um, meet the artists work in that environment, sort of learn how these sorts of kind of environments function and work. And you really get a sort of first hand feel on the actual on directly with the artwork you're actually hanging. But also you get to sort of witness curatorial decisions and the director coming down and making decisions. And it's quite an interesting eye opening kind of environment. The Chisholm Hale I actually only spent about half an hour at. Um, but that actually got me the my my job. Um, when I graduated from Trent, I, I turned up in the morning and, the art, and the, they said to me, you're not needed to, need today because the artist wants to work alone. So I went home, but basically because I turned up, I made sure, made sure it, went on, it went on my CV. <laughs> so, which is like, and I, and I hope that kind of communicates something, you know, that's really important to think about. It's kind of making sure that these sort of things that you think are insignificant, that you pick up on. Or if it just means someone's asked you to do like a day 
helping someone somewhere or helping an artist put up their work somewhere. You just never actually know what comes of those opportunities and what you might learn or what you know comes off that. So when I graduated from Nottingham Trent and the Fine Art course, I sent out my CV everywhere, lots of galleries in London, and um, I was quite surprised that actually three or four got back to me. I think it really helped that I had those three institutions on my CV, which was way like more than a lot of my other peers who I graduated with um, had on theirs. So immediately I put myself kind of ahead of the, the, the head of the game or ahead of whatever. So Wilkinson Gallery in London got back to me and they said, will I come down to London and help them wrap up some work that's going to go to the Freeze Art Fair? So I went and did that. And I've never wrapped a painting before in my life. And they looked like I was putting big nappies on these paintings. I remember them now, like cring I'm cringing at how awful they look. But, and then, but I told them that I'd done it all before and I told them that I'd hang paintings before, but I hadn't done anything like that. But it was okay, I just sort of went, I sort of went with it. Um, that started off as being like a day or two a week. Um, and I also had a job of being here in Nottingham. And I had a really funny run-in with the director, well not run-in because we were kind of friendly, but I had a really funny discussion with Anthony Wilkinson, who's the director of, of Wilkinson Gallery. Um, they represent artists like George Shaw, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, who's doing a project um, at the collection later uh, this year or next year. Or, um, but basically he was like, Tom, could you start kind of doing a few more days for me in the week? And I was like, well actually I've got this really good job being here. Um, where I work like four till nine in the evening, which means I can be in the studio in the morning. It, it worked perfectly for me. And he was just like, he couldn't understand how I was potentially turning him away because I had a job of being cute. But I just, it was just this thing about the fact that it gave me time and that was more valuable to me in, in a way that I had this job that kind of worked around my sort of studio and I was really kind of quite precious over it. And I, you know, working in b and wasn't exactly particularly good. Well, turning wasn't as glamorous as working in Wilkinson Gallery, but you know, it was this. You know, it was this kind of interesting discussion of the, about these two places. But it was really that that thing about time was in a way more valuable than money um, or the prestige of the job for me. I think at that time. Um, but in the end, Wilkinson offered me uh, another day, and you know, we know we sort of negotiated a few things. And so for nearly three, I think it was nearly near just three and a half years, I worked half my week in London, half my week in Nottingham, and commuted between the two. Luckily, I had family that lived sort of two hours. It was High Wycombe, so it's a two-hour commute outside of London, which is quite a long way, but it was the closest thing I had, and I had friends in London. And looking back now, I still can't really believe that I did that for such a long time because it was a, it was a really strange sort of lifestyle in a way. But it was, it was great. It started off as being a very small gallery, um, and they moved into this big museum, double two-storey space on Viner Street, which I'm sure many of you have been to. Um, but that was a really formative time. I learned a lot about professionalism, I learned a lot about working directly with artists and, and that sort of commercial gallery world. So I let go of my being huge job. Um, oh, this has been to, I've got some really bad images on here which I thought might be funny. Last night I thought they were funny, but they might be funny today. <laughs> this is just uh, the freedom of time uh, in this sort of very lovely image. Um, so, Basically, the same time as working when I got the job at Wilkinson Gallery, me and some friends who we'd all graduated with went and got hold of this um, very run-down sort of old. Uh, it must have been an old mill or part of the lace industry in Nottingham. Negotiated with the council to have it for a reduced rate because it was quite run-down. We said that we'd do work on it, so we got it quite cheap. Twenty of us moved in. We did bits of improvements to the building, but generally we kind of kept it as it was with the This is where. Um, Ashley moved into a backlit after we left. Uh, we had this great little courtyard bit down here. We did good parties, and we, you know, we just really at that time there was nothing really like that in Nottingham. There was a these kind of established studio groups that had been around for many years, but there wasn't something which was kind of quite new and and um, yeah, quite you know, it's quite sort of fresh, I guess. So there were there were these kind of three empty office spaces just off the main big halls that we had. Um, and they weren't being used as artists, and a group of us got together and thought about, you know, converting them into a gallery space. Um, initially, it was nine people who sort of put their hand up at the meeting to be involved, and then it went down to five for about two years, and then it was just four of us then for the last sort of three years. Um, but uh, yeah, and then we went and oh, there's meant to be an arts council logo there that's. <laughs> 
hasn't appeared on the screen, which is, that makes a quite a nice abstract image, I like it. But there's meant to be an Arts Council logo there, which is funny. But we, so we talked to the Arts Council, and uh, we, uh, what's really good, I don't know if any of you have experience working with the Arts Council, but it's really nice to just establish a dialogue with them. So actually go to meet them personally. Don't necessarily just submit an application form. It's a very, like, uh, it's a very sort of subjective way of doing it, where you can completely um, miss the point of actually what the Arts Council are interested in supporting. It's really good to go and meet them, and they'll sometimes just sort of say, just change the angle of what you're uh, asking for slightly, and it'll fall in line with what they're into at that time. So we started to kind of get this relationship going with the Arts Council. So we, we, we got a, a small grant to start with, uh, I think it was like four, four to five thousand pounds. Um, that was to convert the gallery space, do some studio visits, and I think do a programme of about two or three shows. Um, we also got Lucky Strike sponsorship, which is really funny. But again, I wanted to put that in because it just shows that you know you can be quite sort of creative in terms of who you get in to sponsor you. So this will be quite controver controversial, obviously, but we quite liked it because of that in lots of ways. So we had this very glamorous um, lady came up from London with like a sort of fold-out sort of wearable shop that was loaded up with packets of Lucky Strike. And when she came into the building, she couldn't, but she was expecting this really glamorous sort of very slick looking white cube gallery and she came to ours and she was like, what, this, is, this isn't right. So she ended up having to give away a pack of cigarettes in the end, which made quite a few people happy, but it was just, you know, it was really, really funny. And we got um, some press about the first exhibition, but the guy just focused on the absurdity of this Lucky Strike sponsorship. So, you know, but it was good. It was kind of good because it kind of got people talking about us a bit. And it was kind of different than just getting your, just your normal run of the mill, you know, local, you know, beer sponsor or something like this was like a big tobacco company, <laughs> which is kind of quite funny, ridiculous. Um, oh, they? Whoa! How did I do that? That's, a, that's, a, that's amazing. I didn't, I didn't know I was expecting that to happen at all. <laughs> okay, well, there, there you go. Yeah. Um, okay, so this was our first show on the left. Artist at the top, Nicholas de Chaise, who's um, shown here. And this was a guy called Dan Keeling, who was like, um, he was like a pagan hip hop rapper, um, kind of Egyptian guy who was doing this thing. And then he had a built, this is the belt buckle that he had, this national lottery funding, which we were meant to have on the front door of the gallery, but he'd commandeered it to be like part of his outfit. But it was good. We, we made sure that the social functions were really good as well as the shows, obviously. It was a really good way of getting a lot of people to come down. And also, um, by doing some things that are social around what you do, it appeals to a far wider range of people. People that are actually interested in contemporary art tend to be quite a minority in lots of ways, but people who are interested in drinking and, and listening to music <laughs> cover a lot of people. So in a way, you're really expanding the audiences. I know it's just applying with alcohol and stuff. I know, you know it's, it's base level stuff, but in a way, it started to build a momentum of what we were doing, and people would come down you know, on a regular basis to come to our events. And, um, um, just a few more clips of, we were just very, we just wanted to be very professional, we wanted to be, stand out in Nottingham definitely, we want people to come to Nottingham, come to the moot, maybe expect because we were in Nottingham or we were in a region that there would be a slightly lower grade of, of quality or there'd be, that we'd be naive about how they do it in London or how they do it in New York or something, but you know, I've been working in London and the guys I was with were kind of quite clued up. So we really aim to have, you know, the people stepped into the gallery and they thought, whoa, this, this kind of feels considered and these guys sort of know sort of what they're on about. We didn't necessarily, but we kind of, you know, we suggested that we did. Um, this piece on the left actually fell down at the opening and fell between people. It was amazing because it would have really hurt. Um, <laughs> it was just wedged in. We couldn't believe it. Didn't, we didn't know the artist had just wedged it in between the floor and the ceiling. It was really funny. But, um, but yeah. Um, just about that thing of just, this is the thing about being professional, you know, and this thing about us kind of working in regions and whatnot. It is an expectation people have. It's a, it's a slight snobbery, maybe, in places like London where they come up to visit and there's an expectation, there's a low expectation of what is, um, of what is done here in Lincoln, in Nottingham, in Derby, wherever. But it's just thinking about the, you know, thinking about those things and actually it's quite nice to, to sort of surprise people and, you know, be ambitious in terms of how you put your shows together and how you create your shows but then 
also thinking about like we made a decision not to show anyone local, so we didn't we didn't show anyone from we're a Nottingham based gallery we didn't show anyone from Nottingham for three years, and the idea and intention of that was basically to m ensure that the gallery was this was established on this sort of national international platform, that it didn't just become a locally serving organisation. By then uh, building moots up to this to have this national international profile. You then bring a local artist onto that. You're not just bringing them onto a local platform. You're bringing them onto like a global platform, which is far more useful for that individual. It's really important to think about your context, and I, I believe, uh, and um, that's something that's kind of I've always tried to sort of do. Um, you know, if you if you sort of show someone who's locally based or local to where you are, maybe maybe doing a group show where they're actually in an exhibition with someone who's from America or someone who's further afield. And then you're both sort of you're putting these people onto the same platform. You're doing things for each person. That person in America wouldn't normally show with someone in Nottingham. Someone in Nottingham wouldn't normally show with someone in in America. So it's doing these things. It's kind of challenging the the kind of context and what the relevance is. What people kind of actually belong to in their in their sort of careers. So that's something we really sort of that's something we really believed in. Um, um, John T. Lee's. This is quite nice. This was a, a train that went round the room. And it had this little um, a little drumstick on the front that tapped these tambourines. And there was a really nice story. There was that this um, this woman would repeatedly come back with her daughter, and they didn't really read it as an art exhibition. They thought it was a kind of like a an interactive playroom or something. So the train got trashed. We went through three trains because this kid just loved playing with it so much. But we didn't have the heart to sort of say, "Can you stop touching it?" Um, so, but it was it was really really nice. I think they came back three times. Each time it destroyed the train, but it was, you know, it was nice. Um, but we played around with, we did, we did, the, we sort of played around with the space. We tried to, we used it as a resource room. Uh, sometimes this was a like an office space, and we had a computer, so we had a record player, and uh, it was quite sort of like, no one really. The thing is with exhibition spaces, no one actually likes going in there. No. Yeah, it's going to People don't necessarily feel that comfortable, sort of, as a viewer going in and sitting with the directors in the same room. So, it didn't get used as much as we wanted it to. But it's good to sort of try out these things, you know. Um, and it's, you know, it means that the space then doesn't just become limited to that of kind of contemporary art and um, or that of a kind of exhibiting of work. <coughs> it can be used as a, a you know, multi multifunctional. We did a members bar series as well, which is, I say members, it was kind of public, but we did, uh, so we ran, the, we ran the gallery as a sort of, like a sort of private drinking den um, for about six weeks, so we did different themes. Um, the image on the left, we built the bar, we dismantled one of the walls we built in the gallery and built a bar out of it, and we served food and, and drink. We had themed events, the top right is, we did a, uh, that was games, so we actually bought a, a, a video wall off eBay, really cheap, and then, had video games on it, and then we commissioned artists to um, make wallpaper and paint the floor strange colours or design furniture. Again, it was just I was learning about what the potential of these gallery places can be. And then we kind of, you know, we'd have these um, straight up art exhibitions, obviously, as well. And this was an exhibition by Jack Strange, who was a new graduate from London, um, who went on and is having a lot of success now. And it was really nice for us to kind of give him his first solo show. And there's a little bit of competitiveness, competitiveness to it in a way because on Jack Strange's CV, you know, his first ever solo show was with us and it will always be on there. And it's quite nice for all the other galleries he now shows with, like we're still kind of number one in 2007 or wherever it was. So we, there, was a, there was a thing about that for us as well. We always wanted to do really at the front and of identifying who was kind of interesting and who was on a kind of an interesting trajectory in terms of their career. Um, there's some rude words that appear on these slides as well, so I apologise if that offends anybody. Um, we started to do art fairs. So this was us going to Zoo Art Fair. So Zoo Art Fair was like the independent freeze art fair. So it was, there's an art fair that usually happens each year called Sunday in London, which happens alongside freeze. This was like, that's kind of like what took over from Zoo. And that was great, because we hardly got any visitors to the gallery in Nottingham. We'd get a big turnout for the opening, and we might get 30, 40 over the course of five weeks. But when you go and do uh, an art fair in London, we get thousands coming by our stand, talking to us, finding out about what we were doing. Um, we also produced really decent um, publicity material as well. We were aware of the fact that we weren't going to get mass audiences for our doors. So we ensured that flyers that we, we produced were really nicely designed. 
publication was really nicely designed. The website was really badly designed, um, um, but that was kind of like a, you know, kind of did that kind of intentionally to try and be kind of different to the galleries at Zoo. We were quite careful about our kind of output, realizing that most people would find out about us through these kind of sort of mediated sort of ways. So that's something to really be careful and think about as well, um, especially operating in, in Lincoln. I don't, I don't and, and the same in Nottingham. The audiences aren't going to be so big, so you have to think about how people are going to experience these projects. And the majority of it will be through websites and through you know handouts and various things. So it's just being like really considering those and making sure that they're really nicely designed and, and considered. So yeah, so we kind of would often. But it was great being at Zoo Art Fair because you know you'd have. So and so gallery New York, so and so gallery Milan, uh, Moot Gallery Nottingham. People, you know, American collectors have come and go, Where's Nottingham? And I, you know, and I was this little kind of city in the Midlands. Um, and that was that felt really good for us. That we were kind of, you know, the only not the only regional gallery, one of the very few. Um, that's there might be a funny effect now. Oh there you go. I didn't I did not plan for that. I wouldn't be that cheesy. Um, Arts Council started to take more interest in us because we were kind of doing these ambitious projects and whatnot. And we um, thought them about professional development and so the idea of really developing the organisation. They were very interested in us pushing commerciality in the region. That's a really big thing. I don't know whether they're, st I think they're still into that, but it was a really big push sort of five years ago was the idea of um, how we can be more sort of commercial in the regions and how we can develop our markets and stuff. So they were very interested in the fact we were doing art fairs and we were selling artwork to art collectors and things. So they made an investment in us and part of that also was scaling up um, our studio visits and who we would go and partner with in different organisations and the like. So the four of us went and had a, a nice European trip and then we went to New York where we did a lot of studio visits and a lot of visits of galleries and met an awful lot of people. Was that funded by the Arts Council? It was, yeah, yeah. Um, they were really supportive of that. Um, and actually, we, Moot was quite an uneconomic model. There's four of us that probably really combined probably did two people's jobs. <laughs> you know, it was kind of interesting. We weren't a slickly run organisation, but it was really important on a kind of personality level that it was four. Of the, it was us four in the room making decisions. So it wouldn't it? It didn't. You know. So if you were to kind of get someone in to kind of analyse it as a business model, they go, "Oh, this is massively inefficient." Like. You know, four of you are going to go and travel around Europe. It's going to cost a fortune, but you know, uh, maybe just two of you should go. But we always believed that the four of us—it had to be about the four of us—and there was an interesting dynamic between us. And dynamics between groups aren't something that you can plan and work out. You know, you put people together; they might get on, they might not get on. We were just lucky that the four of us didn't really get on at times. But that kind of friction and that way of like how we uh, get decisions made was quite interesting. I mean, myself and Candice would fight and we would kind of like argue about our ideas. Matt and Tristan would often kind of mediate and then at the end, the end decision was kind of better than anyone's. And I think that's the sign of a good working group is that the kind of the result decision, the result idea is better than anyone else's individual idea at the start. Um, Can I just ask, was yeah. you basically surviving through the Arts Council at the start of the um, pr Pretty much, yeah. Uh, we weren't getting paid up until that point, um, and apart from we we got there was a generous gentleman that gave us I think about a thousand pounds so we could go and do zoo art fair, and I think the four of us begged our parents for some money at some point as well. So, but yeah, it was dependent on arts council. But this next slide demonstrates what happens when there's no money left, but you still got to got a gallery, and that was always that we we never. We started the gallery on nothing, in a way. I, I, we, we, well, we, I know we got that initial grant, but really the first sort of four or five months of developing the organisation, we didn't really expect to have any money, and there's always a contingency about if we don't get any money, we'll still do these things. Um, the bank account, I think, went down to about, I think we were, had about £18 in the account after doing these various projects and whatnot, and I think the Arts Council weren't, were you know, kind of not interested in giving us any more for a bit. So we were like, right, we, you know, we've got, haven't got a lot of money. We need to do. A, we all kind of want to do a nice project. What can we do? So we did kind of probably the most international of all the pro projects we did. We did. I think it's cost us about thirty pounds, and it was a fax machine that we bought um, off eBay, and then some fax paper. We already had the phone line in the studios, 
And we just emailed artists all over the world and invited them to fax us artwork, um, which they did so over about a month. Um, and it was a really super successful project. Um, the kind of the, the key to it was that it was a nice idea. Like uh, you know, we were really kind of thought this was an interesting idea. It was a nice way to make a publication because you're using one piece of paper. There's no staples. There's no kind of binding involved. Like it just comes. It's a ready-made document. It comes out of one bit of paper. The materials are so cheap. Um, Artists who we approached really liked the idea, therefore we were able to kind of secure some really quite big name artists because they were like, oh this is really interesting, I'm up for doing this. And really so it was a kind of the strength of the idea kind of made up for the lack of the money. So instead of like inviting these artists to show like these sculptures and paintings in the space, we just resisted, we kind of reduced, we kind of reduced everything to just basically their facts as well. So it was great, we had to really ask, some artists would just send us one thing, some artists would send us one thing every single day. At the end of the project, there was a competitiveness between two artists about who was going to send the last thing. So we had a time cut off, and I think the last thing came in like two minutes before the cut off. Um, and then we just had this amazing, I can't remember how it's like 30 meter long um, document. Um, and when we did have some money, we kind of concertinaed it and we had it assembled into a hardbound book. But, um, but yeah, but that was, you know, that was a really key project for us. Um, and it was this thing about you know being ambitious on on actually very very little, um, and yeah. So um, we won the Nottingham Creative Business Awards, which was you know a local business award thing. And probably the four of us didn't necessarily place a massive amount of importance on it at the time. We then, as a result of that, got interviewed by the local paper. Again, we probably overlooked local press too much. We probably hadn't given it enough importance, focusing a lot on art press and being international national. Um, but we got into the local press as a direct result of that article. A local business, um, or the local the director of a big university-owned company called BioCity in Nottingham, got in touch with me and said, "Oh, we've got a derelict building. This is BioCity. We've got a derelict building on our land. Would you like to use it for free?" Which was one Thornby Street. So we had this incredible email on a Friday morning saying, "You know, we've got this amazing th um, four-story building." Um, do you want to use it? So we went down that afternoon and it was just mind-blowing in terms of the potential and opportunity with it. Um, and it really made us realise the importance of things like local press and taking part in local, local opportunities. And something that we probably overlooked too much in it in a lot of ways, but this amazing opportunity came out of that. So um, yeah, so we moved the, uh, so yeah, this kind of stupid slide is in here just also I also just wanted to say that monetary help can happen beyond direct money, but we also work with a local solicitor to give us free legal advice and something. So that was someone that was really important to speak to when we took on this building, because obviously, you know, there are, you know, contracts to be signed and there are various things. Although you're using it for free, you need to make sure that legally things are in place, so that you don't get lumbered with a massive million-pound bill if. The council wants to dig up some pipe somewhere. You know, you need to make sure that if you get onto a free building, rarely is it like completely, you know, free in lots of ways. You need to kind of navigate these things quite carefully. So yeah, so this wasn't a kind of monetary fund. This was a, the the free advice of a local solicitor. And again, the arts council became interested. Um, Did you ever make any money from actually selling art? We covered our costs just about. So if we went to do Zoo Art Fair, we the the overall costs of doing the fair would probably be about um, four and a half thousand pounds. Therefore, we would have to sell nine thousand pounds worth of art to cover our costs. I think we probably lost money on most of those opportunities. Yeah, um, because gallery you take fifty percent, and because we're showing young artists whose prices don't normally command that much over fifteen hundred pounds necessarily for a work. You have to sell an awful lot of it in order to be able to cover costs. Um, so that's something as a young gallery, that's something you kind of have to sort of think about. At the moment in my gallery, um, you know, if I, if I add up the value sometimes of the works in the space, and then I actually think the space that shows up for six, six weeks, if I actually added up the potential of what I could earn off that, it's not a great deal of money really. Um, you say initially you were taking on mainly international artists at the beginning. Was there not some worth tied up in their art? Um, 
we didn't function. I probably should have been more clear. We, we didn't when we first opened. We didn't function as a as a commercial gallery. We didn't say we were a commercial gallery. We were run as a project space. We went and did art fairs and whatnot, but we had no long term commitment to certain artists. We talked about it. We talked about having our roster of artists and representing people, but we didn't want to do it at, at that time. Um, so no, there was only really certain distances we could go with certain individuals, um, and. You know, if you're working with an international artist, they're going to have a major gallery in New York or in London and you're not going to be high importance to them. And quite often if their big gallery in London will probably get involved and cut you out of the deal or something. <laughs> so, um, yeah, kind of on the level of art that we were showing, there was limitations in terms of what we could earn. So anything was a bonus in some ways. Um, I, around about this time, I finished working at Wilkinson Gallery and I um, started to work freelance as an art technician. So all the, um, how long are we doing for time? All the freelance, all, all the experience that I gathered at Wilkinson Gallery, I started to sort of try and put into use in working freelance. So it was quite a step because I'd gone from this regular income to being self-employed. So I had to obviously register myself as self-employed. Um, had to find out all about that. Um, and. Um, this, this is a, a stupid slide, but it's a serious sort of subject. I also got, um, you, also, you should get like, cleared up in benefits and um, working tax credits and stuff. Um, because I know lots of people, I know, I know you can only get them from the age of 25, I think, but it's really important to know all about those sorts of things. Because if you are an artist, you are a professional. You're a professional like a carpenter, you're a professional like, you know, uh, a, you know, IT, freelance IT consultant or something, it's the same thing. So therefore you need to think of yourselves as, as professionals. Therefore, working tax credits and other things which are out there apply to you. So, um, and these things are great, you know, because as artists we spend, you know, many, many hours during the week in our art studios working on products and things that we're producing uh, for exhibitions to potentially be sold. Therefore you're producing a product in the same way as someone is producing a product to go into a shop. It's the same sort of industry. If you think of it like that, um, I'm, you know, I have quite an uncommercial mind in lots of ways. But you know, you can look at it like that. Therefore, you will, um, you know, um, apply, uh, qualify for working tax credits and other benefits and the like. So it's really important to be clued up about those things, um, and the importance of things like accountants and stuff as well. Um, they can think, they can come across as a bit of a layout to start with. But actually, when you go to meet them, they'll they'll save they'll save you money, um, and often you find an accountant in the area that's quite used to working with artists and art organisations. So there's a they have a kind of sympathetic approach to the fact that you might not be able to afford their high fees, and sometimes they give you a reduced fee. The person that I use in Nottingham is kind of quite sympathetic to artists and art organisations. But they also know like the little details about things that you can put through your accounts, um, and. It's all. I mean, it's, it's it's really important to do that and and be, you know, really just start to really consider yourselves as um, as real professional um, people. Um, this was where so moot went from that little space which I showed you at the start, sort of domestic scale spaces, to having a big gallery. Um, this wall here was actually a false wall, so actually the space was an awful lot bigger than that. Um, so that was really scary for us because we went from been able to do a fax machine show to that wouldn't really work in here you know that it would get lost completely so you know it was became more scary prospect for artists as well when you said you want to do a solo show just like what <laughs> this is pretty scary but it was good for us as an organization we've been in that little space for a while um it was starting to become maybe a little bit too easy to curate shows in here so this was a big sort of scary challenge for us, you know, going into a bigger space. And that's Thorsby Street. That's what Thorsby Street is now, yes. Where Trade Gallery in Nottingham is, that's where Moot moved into. So you need a fairly kind of like white cube-esque sort of space. You right, Ash? Yeah, five minutes. Yeah. Uh, Art Fairs in Artissima. Um, this is the last project we did at Moot. We turned the gallery into a bar. Project that Ash touched on, keep floors and passages clear. This is an example of a really, again, like the fast machine project, uh, an ambitious project done on little money. So I really like the safety poster we moved into on Thorsby Street, and I invited artists to make posters in response to that poster that I mounted onto the wall opposite. I paid for this project myself. It was like thirty pounds for the print, and I did one every month. So it was actually very, very little. But again, artists liked the idea. So I was able to ask quite ambitious names and established artists to do, and they, they were happy to be involved. 
And again, it was, you know, it's it was kind of building value into this project. And I showed it at the end on these poster racks. And I got invited to show it at White Collins Gallery in New York. Then the Arts Council collection bought it for their collection this year. So it went from this very sort of, soft, this very sort of modest scale project, um, which I never believed would end up going to New York, and it, it did. And I never in a million years thought that it would get bought by a major institution, and it did. Um, so it's just, again, it's, you know, it's gone from this found poster, £20 a month spent on printing, to being something that's in a permanent collection. And that's, that, you know, that's, that's really important to be, you know, but, um, sort of think about the, the fact that you don't need major budgets to, to, to achieve things. Another project runs called Marble Dreams, where I invite an artist to make a single page of A4 paper, uh, work on A4 paper, photocopy it 500 times to make a ream, and then I produce these as, as works, then people can buy the pages for a pound. I've done 28 of these in total, and this is where I launched it in London. That's my wife eating something. Um, again, it was this project where people, artists just liked the idea. I think if the idea and the framework and the premise is quite strong, again, you can be quite ambitious in terms of who you get involved. And also, it's like, you know, this has been shown in kind of some museum spaces and other galleries and the like, because people just, you know, so people like the idea. But it's not, you know, it costs me, again, it's about £20 to make a ream. Um, and that's a really sort of cheap, um, cheap way of doing a project. And it doesn't, there's no, I don't, there's no gallery space around it, so I don't have to pay any rent or anything. Um, I did teaching. So I'm having to sort of whiz through these last slides a little bit. But I did some teaching, uh, which I've sort of been doing. So it, it was never regular, it was always sort of um, high, um, hourly paid lecturing. That was another way of starting to support myself, as well as doing this freelance technician work. And I went to Glasgow School of Art from 2010 to 2012. Um, I always made my own work, but never had that sort of dedicated studio time in order to do it. So I really wanted to go and do my MFA um, and spend two years doing it without any other distractions. I got a scholarship to do it. Um, again, I really researched about what money is and what was available to me as a student. Um, and I, I asked people who I knew who got that scholarship for their application form. I submitted this application form and I got that funding. Um, that's really worth thinking about as well. Speak to other people that have got funding or Arts Council money. And people are more than happy usually to share around applications and really that's how it kind of works. Um, so it's just be quite sort of savvy in terms of obtaining information from people. Um, after that I moved back home. Um, this isn't entirely reflective of the situation because I actually had a wife and child and that looks nothing like my mum and I was actually didn't really sit on sofas. Um, but you know, this was only a year ago um, we had to go and move. So that was quite a low point in a way, that was like moving my wife and my child back in with my parents because I couldn't get any work together in Glasgow. None of the galleries up there were kind of offering me any, any freelance work. Um, I worked for my brother for six months on the building site, so I was just basically working his, as his labourer. Um, again, it was just really, um, it was brilliant. I loved working, my, um, working as builders, and it was brilliant. But it was, you know, almost it's like a million miles in a way from what I, some of the other projects I've been doing and whatnot. But it was really, you know, it was, a, it was a way in which I could earn a living and support things, and we could save up some money to be able to move out. Moved back up to Nottingham, started to pick up the technician work again. Got an accountant, um, which was really, really good. Um, did a bit more teaching. And I got my own Arts Council funding to open my own gallery. So when I moved back to Nottingham, I decided that I wasn't going to make my own work anymore. All those kind of years of experience of running galleries and working in other people's galleries, really, I always thought one day I would do open my own space, but then um, it was about kind of 18 months ago I decided that I would, I would do this. Um, so yeah, I went and met with the Arts Council. Because of this history and this relationship I had with them that goes back many, many years, they were really interested in having a meeting and we had a really good conversation. Um, about um, what I wanted to do with the gallery. I was very open with the fact that I didn't, I wanted to run very experimentally for the first 18 months, two years. Um, start working in commercially, start contacting collectors um, and taking things a step further from what we were doing with Moot, but still be very open about how you know things work. A commercial gallery model has to be quite different in a region than it, has to, it, it is in London. There's no point in me opening a gallery up here and just denying the fact that you know we live in a city which doesn't really have any art collectors or it does but they don't actually know yet that maybe they can come and buy work from a strange little gallery in the middle of a listed school on the outskirts of town like people take convincing so really i'm on my third exhibition now 
that's Josh, he's sat here, I'll embarrass him with a white shirt on. We actually kind of, we actually, so this artist here, we fabricated this work for him. So again, as a gallery, we're taking a lot of the tasks ourselves. We're able to kind of realise a work which might cost £5,000 if you were to go to an art fabricator to do it. We sort of did it on, I think, £500 because we were able to source our own supplies in Nottingham and make all the work ourselves. So again, kind of like trying to do the work yourself can mean that you can realise really amazing artworks which look very beautiful like that on a much of a reduced budget. Um, so yeah, this was just an example of us kind of doing a bit of, a bit of a sideline in a way to the gallery and fabricating work for other exhibitions and whatnot. Um, again, it's just about being professional, like the same thing with move. I want people to walk into the gallery and feel like this space has been thought about, that when they meet me um, or Josh, that like, the people who are running the space kind of know what they're on about, even if we don't particularly, but it's about communicating that attention to detail. Um, we don't have Larry marketing, we don't really produce any flyers, everything's kind of really stripped back. The idea in a way that you communicate what you do um, through how you actually do it, through the method as opposed to having fancy marketing or having a fancy website. Um, you actually just communicate so that someone comes in and they just like the fact that you've actually kind of like the floor's clean um, or that you've just like wiped the window or something. Like these are really like, sounding insignificant they actually really communicate to other people that you actually care about um, that what you're doing and actually that works way better than a fancy logo or you know anything like that so those are the kind of details which you sort of try and do so if someone does come up from London for the day a curator or something they come to visit they walk in they feel like oh wow this 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 feels really decent um, and they start to really believe in what we're doing and therefore you start to kind of organically grow things so the idea we're actually running the gallery really really quietly um, we are kind of seeking, obviously, press and, and reviews and the like, but the idea is to develop the gallery and the strength of the programme. Um, and just the reputation of the gallery being the thing which commands the attention as opposed to being overly saturating social media of what we're doing or just being mental on Twitter or Facebook. And, because you need to make sure that that, sort of, that product is strong, that like, the product is the most important thing in a way. Um, so in, in a way it's a belief that if someone finds out about the gallery in two years time, they log on the website and they see a history of really interesting projects, it's kind of more important, that, that's almost better than someone finding out, everyone finding out about the gallery on the first day it opens, only seeing one exhibition on there, like it's, it's almost better in a way that someone, that you just sort of do things organically and you just build up a body of work um, and it's this sort of belief that the strength of the work will communicate what you do the best. Um, so yeah, this is just an example of DIY, so it's like, well, we wouldn't build necessarily something that would fall down, but it's just that thing about doing things yourself. Um, that's a really bad, stupid image to choose, but that thing, of, like, so we do our own photography, um, we do our own web design, we do our, so the only outgoing, and also I, I, I don't pay rent on the space, I, do, I get it in return for doing work for the building that I'm in. So the only outgoings I have on the gallery are 15 pounds a month, which pays for, my, um, pays for the, the email MailChimp, server which we use. So the, 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 the overheads are tiny and that's a really good thing to do as well is make sure that you're not be careful what you're investing in. Get those investments good at the start, you know, get a nice camera or a decent computer or those things, get them done and then just, you know, in terms of going forwards, you know, just make sure that the overheads are minimal, that you can exist on very little. That if you don't have an income that comes in for a couple of months that doesn't just mean the project's completely over. Like things can just still kind of move along. Um, and now I, work, I actually have a job, so I've actually gone back to, I work four days a week um, working at Nottingham Trent University, which people have been quite surprised about because there isn't, um, you know, I've opened up a gallery and now I've taken on a four day a week job. But it's that thing about like, having a job isn't actually the, the ultimate, like, the, like, kind of like the baddie, like, actually having a job and not having to depend on your own practice for that financial support is actually quite a liberating thing because it means that you can be experimental in what you do and you're not dependent on a living from your art practice, that you earn your money through your job. And actually, like, it's, it's kind of not always trying to get away from the job and just being sold in the studio. If you can do that, that's fantastic. But like, you know, so I'm quite happy with the fact that I've got this job. Yes, it does occupy a lot of my time, but I know that the gallery isn't, I'm not dependent on the gallery to earn me a living. So therefore, um, I can be experimental with the gallery. In the future, and hopefully it will grow, maybe that will then support myself and the people that, that I work with. But for the time being, like it's quite nice that it cost me fifteen pounds a month, 
um, you know, in terms of my outgoings and obviously um, tapping into Arts Council funding and things that I can do myself during the way and sales. So I am selling work through the gallery as well, but it's very, very a sort of modest level. Um, but, um, but yeah, you start to kind of like find a way through things. I think that's, that's it. So um, thank you.